Well, that is the first successful job of the day. I really, really needed to get this out because look at the amount of seed on there and they are known to be prolific self seeders anyway. This is the first year that I've grown it actually and this has been one of the major successes of this year. It's been fantastic. Not only is it gorgeous looking but such a good spinach for eating. So it's quite a strong flavoured spinach. Um, it's got quite a distinctive flavour and it works really well with sort of Indian flavours and Middle Eastern flavours and that sort of thing. Uh, I made a particularly fine um, tree spinach and turnip, <laughs> it sounds a bit odd, tree spinach and turnip samosas, they were really fine. But yeah, it's been brilliant and also, although now uh, they've really come to an end and the leaves are much, much smaller and sort of not really worth picking off, so I'm just going to put all of this into the pile. So I've taken all of them off and I'm going to just prepare this bed to put the field beans in. Just have a look at how gorgeous the stems are on this. This fantastic pink and green and yellow stripes. I mean, I mean look at that. Absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, but basically that is job number one out the way. The next thing I'm going to do is I've got a second patch of it just up on the top bed, so I'm going to take that out as well. And then we're going to be planting the garlic and the shallots. So, yeah, see you in a sec. So the reason we had the tree spinach in two places was because it was the first year we'd ever grown it. Didn't really know what conditions it liked. So the first lot that I chopped down were in full, full sun, like all the sun comes in that way. And these guys that I've just taken out now were kind of semi-shade. They get the morning sun, but by the afternoon, the bay tree is shading them. And actually, instead of it being kind of a one or other, I think next year we'll do the same thing. We'll have one in the sun and one in the shade because they really complemented each other. So the ones in the sun took off really, really quick and we got a massive picking from them really, really early. Next year we will grow two patches again and kind of pick them in turn. The ones that were up here in the shade, by the time the ones in the sun had really kind of run their course, these ones had kind of come to their own and so we extended the period that we could pick it for far longer than we would have if we'd just had it in one patch. So definitely going to do that again next year. So I've just learned something that I had no idea about. Um, I said in the last vlog that um, I'm more of a uh, shallots from seed kind of a girl and normally every year we grow a variety from seed which is called Zebrun which is a fab variety. It's a really nice long shallot. They're really reliable and they've got like a sort of a delicate purple tinge to them. They're really, really lovely. And the reason that I've based my assumption that I'm more of a shallots from seed kind of a girl to a shallots from sets kind of a girl is that I don't get really the point of onions from sets. So onions, you put a small onion in the ground and you get a large onion out of the ground. And often for us, the onion that comes out isn't that much bigger. I mean, it's about like that kind of size and it just seems to me a bit silly. It's like putting a potato in the ground and just getting a bigger potato out. Like it just doesn't make sense. Whereas if you do them from seed, I can just, it just makes more sense to me basically. But I've just been looking in the Dr. Hessian vegetable expert book just to look at spacing on the shallots because the shallots we've got are just in a paper bag uh, picked out of a tray. And that's not how shallots grow at all from sets. Have a look, can you see? This is a small onion, and a big onion. Well look, a shallot, loads of shallots. You put a small, you put a shallot in the ground and you get, it says like 12 shallots from one shallot. It's brilliant. So yeah, uh, I might be a bit of a convert, but what I have discovered is that 
because they grow like that, they need to be really quite far spaced apart, about 35, 40 centimetres apart. And the bed that we had assigned for shallots and garlic, when I've marked that out, because we've got 20 shallot bulbs, that's basically the whole bed. But we're not going to plant them until mid-November because that's what uh, the Lord Internet says. But that's the whole bed that we've assigned to it. So I've marked out where the shallots are going to go and just put a little lolly stick in each of the holes. And then I'm going to plant the garlic interspaced between them so that the shallots have a really good round space around them so that they can grow to their maximum. And because the garlics grow quite upright and they're not going to spread too far, we're going to kind of do like a checkerboard pattern for space saving. So on the subject of garlic, this is the one we've gone just like bog standard packet version as opposed to the shallot. Um, I know you can buy the ones in the supermarket, but I didn't. But I've decided to go for hard neck garlic. To be perfectly honest, I, sort of, I understand that hard neck garlic has a hard neck and soft neck garlic doesn't, but I didn't really kind of look into the major differences of them. After watching Alex from the Essex allotment talking about choosing his garlic, because he's recently taken on a really large plot of land uh, to grow for CSA boxes, um, he actually had to make quite an important decision about what garlic to use because it's going to be, you know, for other people. So he did a bit about the differences between hard neck and soft neck. And from that conclusion, the main one that got me, so uh, soft neck garlic stores much better because its skins are much tighter. And then the hard neck garlic, obviously it's got a hard neck and you can eat the scapes or whatever, but the crucial bit is that the skins aren't so tight. Now I know I'm not gonna be growing enough garlic for my whole year's worth of garlic because I eat a lot of garlic. So I'm not that worried about the storage. I'm just gonna be growing and I'll be eating it within a couple of months, so it's not a problem. The crucial bit, like I say, is the loose skin. There's nothing that sends me into a fit of rage than not being able to get the skin off garlic cloves in the kitchen. So I've gone with loose skin, doesn't store very well. I'm happy with that choice. Anyway, I'm gonna go and break them up, see how many cloves we've got uh, that are worth planting on these and get them spaced out between my shallot markings. Let's go. So this is the bed that we took the radishes and the uh, second wave peas out of last week. Now we're going to put in the garlic. So that is my shallot spacing marked out. The lolly stick colours don't mean anything, I just didn't have enough of the same colour. But have a look in this corner. This is a little radicchio that we just cut off at the bottom and it's given us three hearts so far. It's incredible. And these are the two garlics. This first one is Carcassonne, which is a fantastic pink colour. Look at that. Actually, that looks a bit scary, it looks like teeth. That's the hard neck in the centre. It gives it its name and got there's some quite big cloves in here actually. Quite big. Such a bright colour, isn't it? Really pretty, pretty garlic, this one. So when you're planting garlic, they often come like this in a whole bulb. You just break them off. I'm not gonna plant these little tiny ones in the centre because they don't really form much. This one is the Lautrec. Uh, white cloves. I'm just going to do the same thing. There's its hard neck and break off the larger cloves. I reckon I'm going to have about 20 here. So when you're planting them you want nice big cloves like I say. Separate them all out. This is the top bit where it's going to grow from. I mean I'm sure you know that and underneath that's where the roots are come from so you want to put them in the ground that way up. So I'm planting each clove directly uh, centred between sort of four of my shallot spacings. This is giving the garlic way more space than it would need. It doesn't need this much space. Uh, it's just that I'm trying to get them into the same bed as the shallots that do need a lot of space. So this just kind of is a way to maximise the space. When you're planting them, the garlic cloves want to be about two inches under the ground so it's just a hole stick them in the right way up obviously and then firm the ground over the top and they're good to go
Okay, it's quite early, but I might be leaving it a bit this morning. That is soggy. It's not meant to last too long though. Right, first job of the morning, we are at Wix and I'm going to be picking up the drain pipe to put on the back of the poly tunnel. When you've got a square is what I'm, which means it's recording, doesn't it? Square, yeah. <laughs> Just in case. Cool, lovely. Right, I'm about to put the um, drain pipe up against the back of the poly tunnel, but I'm just going to warn you, it's going to be with no sound because in the school next to me, we've got some blooming group doing I don't know motivational course or something and they're all standing in a circle and shouting positive messages at each other which is all very well and good but there's nothing more guaranteed out there to make me not motivated than a motivational course and this one appears to involve just this short militant woman shouting commands at people like they're three years old and they're actually grown adults so I'm going to do this complete without sound and try and ignore it myself. Oh god, they're doing star jumps and pretending to be frogs now. They're singing funky, funky seaweed. So it probably looks like I've put this at a really extreme slope downwards to um, funnel. It is on a slope, but it's only really marginal, going straight into the bucket here. But this whole path, our whole allotment is on a slope going down. 
and so to get the water to flow essentially uphill it's having to go sort of at quite an angle because this is all one big slope and then really all I need to do is from that um, flue at the top I just need to put in a downpipe straight into the hole that's already cut in the top of this water butt <laughs> It is Sunday morning um, and about 30 seconds ago it was really bright sunshine but it's kind of like dappled cloud and it's going in and out. We don't have the um, self-motivation group or whatever they were yesterday going on luckily but there does appear to be a car show or something because there's a load of fancy minis, if you can have a fancy mini, fancy minis in the um, playing field next to us uh, and they keep kind of gunning their engines so if you can hear that, that's what's going on, sorry. <laughs> Not ideal recording conditions this week, is it? Um, but it's a gorgeous morning and because it's the weather's looking pretty good for the next couple of days, it means that we're going to have some really cold nights because there's going to be no cloud cover. So we're starting to think about wrapping up the greenhouse to keep a bit of warmth in there. So last year we put the bubble wrap on the outside of the greenhouse which worked really well because we've got a lot of sash weights you know the weights that used to go inside sash windows and we just rolled it up on either side and that kept it really firmly in place we only lost one piece when we had one of those really vicious storms in the middle of the winter um, but I was thinking about those little green clips that we used to string up the melons and the cucumbers this year and we're going to put the mum's done a bit of a test run in there and it's worked really really well so we're going to put the bubble wrap on the inside this year and use those green clips but the first thing we have to do is give it a really good wash down because we are in London and we've got there's an aeroplane going over give me a second oh it's a really big one it's a double decker double decker emirates this one But something else that we have to do before we get the um, bubble wrap up in there is we need to give it a good wash. Um, you know we had all the problem with the spider mite and um, I like one of the ways to get rid of spider mite is to make the atmosphere a lot more humid because they don't like that. Um, so I was like giving a mist in there all the time but we've got really really hard water here. Um, so there's a lot of marks all over the glass and also just because at the end of the summer there's lots of marks on there anyway. So we're going to give the greenhouse a really good wash and then bubble wrap the inside. Morning, I'm going to finish my cup of coffee. Hope the sun comes out again because washing down the greenhouse in the chill isn't so nice. Um, and then we go.
So the way these clips work, um, if you didn't see my video at the beginning of the summer, is you just um, sort of click them into the aluminium frame of the greenhouse and twist them round. So in this case, they are just holding the uh, bubble wrap on, but they've got a hole in them, so you can use them to string up. They've been amazing and I will put a link underneath because when I first did the video I couldn't actually find where I'd got them from but I've since found them on Amazon so I will just stick the little link. There's lots of different types of them but if I send you in the right direction you sort of know what you're looking for then. And with all that moving, the aubergines backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards trying to fit around them, we actually only had one casualty so I'm pretty pleased with that. Well, I've been ousted outside it's pretty chilly hence the hat uh, but mum's listening to the radio and so I can't record inside so <laughs> I've been ousted into the back garden fair enough I suppose uh, at least I've got a glass of wine well one thing I was going to show you is look at these broad beans that I sowed last week huge although I would say not fantastic germination we've got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. About twelve haven't come up. Um, I'll have a bit of a root around in there and see if they're just being slow or just maybe crap germination. Who knows? Oh well. <laughs> hmm. So, what did we get done this week? I've just realised I look a bit like sort of something out of a fairy tale with this and not not the princess either like the old witch in the woods with this kind of like gnome's hat and little cardigan but never mind I'm going with it um so what did we get done this week main job was definitely boy racer on a motorbike uh, main job was definitely getting that water barrel and um, drain pipe up I'm so so pleased to have got that up so there's a number of reasons that uh, being able to harvest rainwater is really important. One of the basic reasons is purely it's a resource and in the summer we often face shortages of water in our reservoirs and watering the garden isn't really a priority with water. I said before when I was cleaning out the greenhouse, oh it's raining, oh well, it'll be a spritzer. Um, there are other advantages. So. We've got very, very hard water here in London and rainwater is soft and it doesn't have any of the bits and pieces in it like chlorine and various other things that they put in and salts to make the water drinkable. So it makes it safe for us to have in our taps and drink. But those same things that, that make it safe for us to drink actually aren't that great for the plants. Having said that, rainwater is not pure water. I mean, as it's coming down from the sky, it's picking up pollutants and particulates in the air. And when it lands on a roof, say for example, on the top of my polytunnel, you may have noticed a couple of aeroplanes this time. We don't live that far from Heathrow. And when the weather's right, the planes do come straight over the top of us. And that is all going to be falling on the roof and pollution from cars going past, all that kind of stuff is going to be resting on that roof so when the rain comes down what it hasn't picked up in the air it's going to pick up on that roof and bird poo and all the other bits and pieces which the plants don't mind but you wouldn't want to drink if you see what I mean. Another thing is that rainwater is ever so slightly acidic and that's the opposite of drinking water and so when you use something slightly acidic in the soil it actually frees up some nutrients that are quite difficult to pick up for plants that are already in the soil it kind of makes them available um, which is a bit, bit of an advantage and the other thing is that there are nitrates dissolved in rainwater so um, you know when you're using a fertilizer on your plants it's normally got an NPK value uh, the end part of it is nitrogen and the plant needs nitrogen to form its leaves and to grow its foliage basically that's more complicated than that we all know but that's the basics of it and when you're using a fertilizer it generally has nitrogen in it so when you water your um, tom right or whatever it's got all nitrogen in it that goes in as plain nitrogen into the soil and then it has to be converted by the microbes that are in the soil into nitrates rather than nitrogen and then the plants able to use them whereas in the rain it's actually already nitrates and so nitrates is a combination of nitrogen and oxygen 
which is freely available to the plant. So that's fantastic. One of the things about saving rainwater though is that if it's in a water butt for a long time, those nitrates do um, dissipate slowly. So um, rainwater's got really like a good quantity of nitrates in it. If you store water in a butt for a year, it's not gonna have the same effect. But still, you know, it's still interesting. And the other thing that was quite interesting about it that I found out recently is that when that rain from a thunderstorm, so when there's actually lightning going off, it's the lightning that um, binds the nitrogen and the oxygen together to form the nitrates. So rain in a thunderstorm has got much higher nitrates in it than just kind of, you know, drizzle like I'm sitting in now. So what else is there? We picked the last, well, what I think is gonna be the last courgette this morning. Uh, this is Green Tiger, one of my absolute favorite courgette varieties. It's beautiful markings, look at that. Really, really clearly defined stripes of really vibrant green, but not ridged, it's very, very smooth. We grow a couple of stripy courgettes, but this is the only really smooth one. Some of the Italian ones can be really heavily ridged. Still delicious, but I just particularly like this one. So that's on the list for next year, most definitely. So what else did we do? Greenhouse is extremely cozy. So when I do get those chilies out of the polytunnel, it's not going to be too much of a hideous shock for them when they go into the greenhouse. So that's really good. Um, and also, I'm so pleased I got the garlic in. And how weird is that about the shallots? I had no idea. Then again, I don't know why I would have any idea because I've never actually grown them from sets before. So it's never kind of cropped up in my life. And I really did just think they were like onions. Um, yeah, so that was a bit of a turn up for the books. I'm pretty pleased with that. Uh, and we'll get them in next month. About the same time as the field beans. I'm starting to clear quite a lot of beds for field beans now, which is the green manure that we're using mainly this year. Um, but it really is raining quite a lot now. <laughs> um, uh, what was I going to say? I better round this up really, shouldn't I? Um, saying just then oh yeah green manure um, yeah so the field beans are the main green manure that we're going to be having over winter this year I uh, need to get them in sort of late October so uh, we're clearing the beds for them now you may have noticed we've got a lot of bare beds but they are just waiting another couple of weeks to get the green manure in so that's pretty exciting means that we're not going to have bare beds over winter. Bare soil over winter is really a problem, particularly we've got very, very sandy soil and as it rains through the winter and gets cold, it basically just washes the nutrients completely out of the soil. So having something growing in that ground just keeps the structure of the soil really strong and stops everything just being washed out of it. So that's why we're using the field beans this year. Oh, it really is raining now. Right, I'm going to finish this glass of wine and See if mum's radio program's finished. This afternoon I'm going to be sowing some more Cavalinero. I've got eight plants growing in the brassica beds up at the plot already, but we're starting to get into, you know, panic mode when you start eating stuff and you're like, oh my God, it's not going to be enough. We're going to be out without kale for the winter. And you know, you go to Waitrose and they charge you about seven quid a kilo for Cavalinero. So, and I'm not going to be buying that. So, got to plant some more of that I've got to finish this glass of wine I'm getting soggy so I'm gonna say thank you so much for watching as always I appreciate it so much if you're subscribed already marvelous if you're not and you enjoyed the video the subscribe button will be on the screen at the end of the video or you can just hit subscribe underneath um, if you've got any questions or any comments drop me a line underneath I always love getting your comments and if you've got anything specific to ask me let me know and I Again, as always, 